NDPA presents the Water Safety Champion Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to episode five of the NDPA Water Safety Champion Podcast. I'm Adam Ketchmarchi, the Executive Director of NDPA, and not joined today by uh, my co-host or uh, the co-host for part one of this season, Alyssa Magram. Today, I actually have the pleasure of just doing a one-on-one podcast uh, with someone who's ultimately going to be a new guest host on the podcast, and that's Alan Korn. Uh, Mr. Korn, how are you doing today? Good, Adam. It's my pleasure to be the fifth uh, guest on, on your episode. I think it's uh, wonderful that you're doing it. Glad to make it into the top five. Uh, We would have it no other way. Well, Alan, I'm going to just go ahead and roll right into it. Um, You know, as our listeners know, uh, you know, the goal of the podcast is to have water safety champions share about their background, their water safety story, and kind of ultimately what led them to become water safety champions. And, uh, you know, you are definitely in my top five water safety champions out there. So uh, rightfully so in the first five episodes, we're getting to you. So, um, you know, let's start out with that question, you know, um, um, this is all about, you know, your history. So um, how did Alan Korn get involved in uh, water or water safety? Yeah, well, I, I, I originally, I'm an attorney by training and I practiced law for seven years and uh, moved to Washington, D.C. and uh, to get married, fell in love with a girl in Washington, D.C., still in love with the same girl or some mm-hmm. form of it. Uh, and we're still together. And when I came to Washington, D.C., I thought I'd try something a little different than than the traditional practice of law, which is quite consuming and uh, not much mission filling, at least the type of law I was practicing. It's commercial litigation, courtroom uh, stuff. And I happened to land a job uh, convincing enough, enough and surprisingly enough with the Children's National Medical Center, which is the children's hospital here helping them do the legal work and the lobbying for one of their major programs, which was, and still is, the Safe Kids Worldwide, Safe Kids USA program, which most everybody in injury prevention knows. And I did that for you know close to 20 years, doing legal work, lobbying work uh, for the hospital, and in particular for that program. During that time, Adam, I was a jack of all trades. Uh, when it comes to injury prevention. I knew a little bit about a lot of things, but a lot of bit about nothing. Meaning, my day went from toy safety to carbon monoxide, to smoke alarms, to furniture safety, to child safety seats, bike helmets, you name it. I mean, recall effectiveness, all that kind of stuff. And about, I don't know, maybe... You know, 15 years, don't hold me to the exact date, we got a visit, you know, from Nancy Baker. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had all known about the death of her child. uh, And we won't go into deep, most people know that story, but she lost a child to an entrapment at the bottom of an in-ground spa attached to a pool. And she was being the force of nature that she was, wanted to make some sense of of her child's death and was literally canvassing the organizations in Washington, D.C. And she met with many of them. And I won't mention names because she was displeased with the reaction that she got from them. It Water safety, certainly entrapment prevention, wasn't on any radar screen including mine. And for some reason, uh, we hit it off, she and I. And the founder of Safe Kids, his name is Marty Eichelberger. He was the trauma head of trauma surgery at Washington, D.C. And the founder of Safe Kids uh, pretty much said in our first meeting, we want to help. This is a quote unquote easy fix. It was not. Uh, But he meant, we have a solution, let's find a public policy response. And I'll I'll shorten up the story a little bit, because I'm sure we'll get to it more in the conversation. We signed on with Nancy and her father-in-law, Secretary of State James Baker, and the family writ large, and started understanding the issue of water safety. To be totally clear and transparent, started with entrapment. 
but of course it has morphed importantly and critically to all water safety over the past 20 years. So let me ask Alan before that, um, before Nancy came to Safe Kids, I mean, was water safety, no, maybe not entrapment, but water safety, was that on Safe Kids radar? Um, Cause I know they're very big participants in the field now. Yeah, yeah, it, I would say yes, in the same standard as I said, a jack of all trade. I am sure we were doing things related to fencing and supervision, maybe occasionally being reactive to a piece of legislation for four-sided fencing or perimeter fencing, pool covers or something like that. I was more than generally aware of the issue, mm -hmm. but it was Nancy and her story that brought it home for me. And let me pause here for a second, just tell you a quick story. Sure. I think it's interesting. Uh, maybe you will too. About this time, my son, who now is 23, was about four years old, and we had taken him down to Disney with another family, which is important to the story, who had a seven or eight-year-old with, with them. And after a long day at the park, we, of course, went to the Disney hotel pool, and then I put on the little life jacket, a life jacket, not anything but a life jacket, and we spent an hour. It could have been two. It may have been three. Him jumping into the pool, into my arms, splash, 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 giggle, 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 blow bubbles back to the side of the pool. I did it until my skin was pruned. Yep. The next day we finished at the park and Benjamin ran ahead of me through the gate and jumped in the pool. And the, and if you've ever been to Disney pool, you know, there was, uh, there could have been a hundred people in the pool. There could have been 200 people in this big pool. I think it was the wilderness lodge, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And Jack, the seven-year-old, came running to me as I was just getting into the gate, then jumped in the pool. I mean, he spotted it. And I ran to the side of the pool, and it maybe only took me a few seconds to, to find him. Could have been three seconds, could have been five seconds, but I found him quickly. But in that five seconds, my world was collapsing. Nothing mattered. Not my wife not my family, not my money, not my profession, nothing. I mean, it was consuming in that five seconds. Thankfully, I saw him and he was going down. And I jumped into the pool, of course got him. He coughed a little side of the pool and was ready to play some more. It affected me for at least two, three days. I remember showering in the morning, hoping I could hot water shower this angst away from me. And it took a while. Just repeating the story kind of makes my head, you know, hair stand up uh, on the back of my neck. I just learned the other day those are called hackles. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Get the hack, don't don't get your hackles up. The hackles on your back, your my neck were were were, and I remind myself of that story. Of course, you and I professionally hear yeah. other people's story regularly. Yeah. Uh, and it didn't without a good outcome. And but I'm selfish, too. We all are. It reminds me of my old story and that five seconds where anything could have happened. Well, you know, and I, I think this is something we hit on in a way frequently in drowning prevention is, you know, we often lock into these fatal statistics, right? And then, you know, beyond that is the non-fatal statistics that we have. And those statistics aren't as strong as what we have on the fatal side. Um, but I often remind people just because we have some data around non-fatal drownings, what is interesting is if you, if you read the fine print there, it says seen in an emergency department. Mm -hmm. And why I bring that up is, you know, they say the CDC for every one fatal childhood drowning that we have another seven are seen in an emergency department for a non-fatal submersion injury. Well, what you just described Ben was never taken to the hospital. Ben was never seen in an emergency department. So, you know, and, and the reason I say that is, you know, we often find as we talk to people, I know you travel a lot. I travel across the country all the time uh, doing the work that we do. And, you know, oftentimes I'm in an airport or on a plane and someone says to me, oh, what do you do? And I'll say, you know, I work for in drowning prevention and um, they'll share a similar story, whether it's their child, whether it's themselves, whether it's a cousin that had a close call 
we'll say. So it is, to me, it, I always go back to how wide this problem is and how often it touches people. Yeah, you know, in my own personal experience, as you say, what's my water story? I'm not a professional swimmer. I'm an enjoyer of the water. And when I mean enjoy, I mean, probably like you, Adam, jump in, drink in hand, uh, wait for the dinner later at some resort or a afternoon swimming pool or barbecue. I know how to swim. I'm a decent swimmer, but I by no means do it. But I enjoy the water. I get around the pool a lot. And at least once a year, you witness something. Last year, I was laying by a pool uh, with one of my brothers, and we were watching an actual swim lesson on the other side of the pool. The kids holding on to the side of the pool, and the teacher kind of, they were each kicking and blowing bubbles and so forth like they do in a swim lesson. And a kid on the end let go and went under. And I kind of looked at my brother. He kind of looked at me. Oh, certainly the teacher's going to see it. It was taking too long for us comfortable. We both ju screamed, jumped in the water, and thankfully she picked up on it and was able to do it. So you talk about death. You talk about, of course, the emergency room visit, sometimes lifelong effects of drowning on a much lower scale, but certainly representative of the emotion around drowning a complete stranger did not know this kid and i was it took again another day to kind of wash yourself of the experience you know uh, uh nancy baker once said to me there's something different about drowning you know in a car crash it happens fast uh certainly a, a gun violence we're seeing so much in, in america it happens fast there's a lack of consciousness to it Drowning when a child goes under, there's a recognition that something's not effing right. Hope I can say effing on this podcast. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I edited myself. That <laughs> you know, there's some recognition that oh my god, I'm in trouble and I need help. Yeah. And uh, you know, of course, some tragedies can happen after that, and that's a very spooky kind of disturbing way to think about drowning. Um, so you're right. The whole spectrum is needs to be addressed. And we do talk about all these type of things all the time. Well, and so let me ask you, I know, I know most of our audience is familiar with the Virginia Graham Baker Act. And, um, you know, I, I, I would assume that's probably one of your, you know, proudest career achievements is you know, getting that law passed. Um, you know, and I, I say this all the time, you know, that's the only federal law dealing with water safety. Right. Um, so let me just pause there and kind of ask you, what was that like getting that law passed? Um, I know there was, was it was an uphill battle to get that law finally uh, finally through. Yeah, it took a little over two years, but by Washington, D.C. Uh, custom or practice, um, that's, you know, a lot of people would be thrilled with the two year. Um, and uh, yes, it is one of my, proudest moments and one of my greater uh, accomplishments. I feel silly saying that because I try to keep ego in check when I talk about these things, but I am very proud of it. And um, listen, ultimately never, and a message for your audience, mm -hmm. never underestimate the power and the effectiveness of a mother. Notice I said mother here, a mother who has lost a child. And Nancy's partnership with Safe Kids and myself, and we spent a lot of time together, and you know we're still friends to this day, she was a force of nature. Mm -hmm. And I, if truth be told, was trying to keep her expectations in line because I was used to funding issues on injury prevention and child safety issues. And, and I, of course, a consumer of the news on the craziness, even back then, mm -hmm. as to what goes on on Capitol Hill. And she would literally lecture me saying, enough with that, let's charge forward. Mm -hmm. And we did it in a fashion that, that was, in many respects, sophisticated, meaning we had to sit down and write a piece of legislation with the help of staff, but write a piece of legislation, and also very pedestrian spending time on Capitol Hill, wearing out soles or your shoes, I'm exaggerating, but a lot of 
steps, a lot of meetings explaining what's happening. And at the same time, or very close, the Taylor family had their accident. Yeah. So we started to get attention, unfortunately, but fortuitously, members of Congress saying, whoa, 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 what's going on here? You know, we've had two deaths in a period of a, of, of a year from entrapment. Isn't there something we could do? And then finally, the, the Cone family had their experience, which was just more perfect storm. I, I, you know, I'm curious, and I, I don't know what the experience is like on this, but, you know, we look at, um, you know, no matter where you are on the political spectrum, it, it, it's a little nutty in Washington, D.C., you know, very tribal by party, things like that. And what I find so interesting with the VGB legislation is, you know, this was um, uh, a Democratic House and Senate, if I remember correctly, in the in that congressional yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, session. Um, Republican president, it was George Bush at the time. And, right. you know, when you think about bipartisan, it's almost a, a, a dirty word in today's political, you know, sense. How did that work? I mean, you know, you have, um, you know, obviously Virginia Graham was, was uh, her grandfather was Secretary of State James Baker under uh, George H.W. Bush. Um, then, you know, you have President George Bush as the, uh, you know, president when the bill passes. And then you had, um, I'm assuming I, I could be wrong, but uh, Harry Reid in leadership in the Senate. Very good. Uh, uh, Adam, let's, that's impressive. And, right. and, and I think that was Nancy Pelosi's first, uh, first congressional term as speaker at the time. Right. It, 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 it could have been. Uh, you're, you're, you might know more than me. I think it was Nancy Pelosi at the time. I watched too many yeah. history documentaries on YouTube. But uh, yeah. uh, the reason I ask this, I mean, even in those days, I mean, you know, things rising to the top and bipartisan, you know, approaches to legislation um, wasn't that common, you know, probably less common today. But how did that work? I mean, how did you have, you know, really strong, um, you know, representation from Amy Klobuchar and Debbie Wasserman Schultz? And then also, you know, being able to, to hook the Republicans in at the same time. Right. Well, you know, I used to say, I can't say it as much as I used to, that, um, you know, I, we won't get political, but I, I used to be able to say that despite all its pimples and craziness, democracy still works. And I guess to an extent it still does. It's just the pimples are much, much bigger. But um, at the time there was craziness, but it was normal craziness, mm -hmm. meaning there was some tribalism and some partisanship and so forth. But the power of a mother, the power of a mother who has a family of political royalty, uh, who Secretary of State James Baker, I read his biography, not autobiography, but biography. Uh, he was considered the gold standard and is still held up now as the Secretary of State that all others should replicate. So he had quite a reputation. And I don't want to ever, ever, ever suggest that you know, Alan Korn was moving and shaking. I played a small role over time. I can do more of that now. But listen, having that family on your side and be able to connect to both sides was absolutely instrumental. In yeah. fact, I remember this, the very first hearing we had on the Senate side, here we are at the table, Nancy sitting next to me, I'm sitting uh, next to her, I think the CPSC uh, was uh, next to me, and it was Senator McCain's, you remember him, uh, he's passed away, um, and a presidential candidate and a longtime senator from Arizona. It was his hearing room, and he basically opened up his statement saying, what the heck, and he didn't say heck, we have a child that died in the bottom of a pool in Virginia, how the heck did that happen? Mm -hmm. We have to do something about it. Then Senator Stevens, I don't want to go through, this is all inside baseball. He was a very powerful Republican member from Arizona, said the same thing. What? You mean to tell me uh, we, someone died and trapped at the bottom of a pool? Can that happen to sp in spas and hot tubs? I've got a lot of those in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And the conversation, I could feel the change in the room from basically an education and oversight hearing to a, we need to get something done. And yeah. that catalytic moment 
of those two members showing interest, along with Klobuchar and Senator Allen and a lot of names. I could Senator Dodd, if you remember him from Connecticut. That was the starting point from, all right, we need to put pencil to paper. And even yeah. the industry, even the industry at that time, they were sitting behind me. I could hear a mumble, mumble, knew that this was more than just a one-off, this hearing. Something was going to come of it, not necessarily guaranteed success, but there was going to be an effort, a public yeah. policy effort. And sure enough, there was. So, Well, let me let me ask you, because I, I think this is something that, you know, we've talked about a lot, you know, NDPA has often asked this question around future legislation. You know, I know you and I both personally track a lot of bills at the state level. Um, you know, both you and I have testified on bills all around the country trying to make water safer. Um, but, you know, sometimes, and I don't want to make this just a civics lesson in our discussion, but, um, you know, I, I had a really interesting, you know, conversation with Debbie Washerman Schultz just last year at our conference. And I know she mentioned this on on stage in front of everyone is sometimes the federal government's power is quite limited uh, to what they can do to solve a problem. And, and you know, that goes to the 10th Amendment and power to the states and, uh, you know, providing them the right uh, level of uh, governance power in their own jurisdictions. But um, I love it, the pocket constitution. Um, uh, again, but since I, the podcast you can't see it, but I do keep it readily hit because she's right. There's only so much Congress can do. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I guess that's my question. I mean, we're obviously, you know, both you and I are, are probably constantly asked, what else could we do at the federal level? And I'm, I'm curious as to what your thoughts there is. I know we're underway with, um, you know, a potential VGB reauthorization, hopefully for a little bit longer this time. But is there other things, I guess, the federal government could do in your eyes um, to, to either support our work in water safety or to really help make an impact on reducing the drowning numbers? Yeah, I mean that 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 is a is a is a topic for a podcast that could stand alone. Oh yeah. There there is there are lots of things, lots of limited things that Congress can do in order to affect injury prevention. One, and I'll kind of list them together. Yeah. One is the incentive component. Uh they can't make homeowners put fencing in their backyard. That's up to the states. Mm -hmm. But the Congress, which they've done on many, 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 many safety issues, can incentivize states to say, if you pass a law that addresses this safety, we'll give you a little bit of a, a little bit of money to help with the compliance, with the enforcement. And they do that regularly. Point of weight laws, even the speed limit law. Back in the day when there was a 55 mile speed limit law, that was as a, a result of the government. Some people say sticking their nose yeah. in states business, but I would say incentivizing states to do the right thing. Well, so that's one component that that Congress plays a role. And the VGB has that component in it. A lot of bills do. Uh, uh, yeah. You have a question or, or well, so no, I'll tell you where my head goes with that is uh, is the drinking age and the state highway funding. Um right. Or the federal highway funding, yeah, right. Point oh eight, point oh eight laws, like yeah. you say, or open container laws, were all passed at least in part because of incentive grants. I, I always like to give the example uh, that every gallon of gas that you put in your car, seventeen cents of it goes to the highway trust fund. Mm -hmm. That's what what the fund is called, highway trust fund, and it is um, billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. Well. Congress uses that money to infrastructure, to build bridges, fixed bridges, fixed highways, the highway system, all of that kind of stuff. And they give that money to the states. And sometimes they attach little components to it, like, hey, pass a, a point of weight law in your state, you'll get more money. Or that's the carrot approach. The mm -hmm. stick approach is if you don't pass an point of weight money, point point oh eight law, or 21 drinking a law, law, we're going to give you less of that money. So that's just an example. Yeah, and that's yeah. one of the, as you say, what is Congress's role? They, they have the power of the purse, for lack of a better way of saying it, and they'll utilize it. And uh, the VGB, in a very, 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 very small way, does it. There was a new piece of legislation passed late, last year on carbon monoxide detector laws in the states, and a little bit to promote states to get people to put carbon monoxide detectors up in their home. So that's 
one. The other thing, and there's lots of things, but the second thing that comes to mind is because Congress cannot really tell you what to do, mm -hmm. use fencing, wear a bike helmet, they do have the power to make sure that whatever products are in the marketplace, like pools or the components of pools or bike helmets or child safety seats, that they're built safely. Mm -hmm. And they have a, through the agency process, sometimes the government congressional process, they can uh, uh, influence and, and regulate the character and quality of the products themselves. Mm -hmm. That's why they were able to ban certain drain covers mm -hmm. and make sure they're built in a certain way. Uh, the use of them in private pools is up to the states, mm -hmm. but um, bike helmets, they can't, there's no such thing as a, you, as a national bicycle helmet law, but the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which is a creature of Congress, has bicycle helmet standards. Cribs, toys, uh, staplers, uh, you know, whatever it is, can all, if they pose an unreasonable risk or serve a safety purpose, can have come. So all the things that are around a pool can be regulated, the fencing, the locks, the drains, even the shepherd's hooks. That's not to say that there's a standard for every one of them, but they could get wrong, involved if they see a pattern a trend of deaths or problems with a product. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I think it's interesting too, because, you know, in some ways, um, you know, I'm often asked, why don't you do more work internationally? And this is, you know, really from my colleagues on the research side. And um, I, I oftentimes, I've taken a lot of flack for this over the years, honestly. As, um, if, your, as if your job isn't big enough, I mean, well, you know, usually my response to them is, you know, it, it usually it goes something like this. Well, 92% of the world's drownings happen low and in middle income countries. So why aren't you, you know, using your expertise to focus on those? And I look at the United States as such an interesting animal um, comparative to other highly developed nations, because we have a very different government structure from, you know, what we've been talking about where, you know, you have the federal system, but then you also have the states. Um, and as I like to describe the United States to some of the, the people in other countries that I work with is we are like 56 independent countries who are connected through a federal system. And, yeah. Yeah. and that creates a lot of unique challenges. And then you layer in our geography and, you know, all the other things. I mean, Abby's Hope is central to Minnesota. Um, and, you know, I know uh, we both, you know, you working for Abby's Hope and us as NDPA and Abby's Hope being partners, um, you know, what I find interesting there, I mean, the drowning risk that we focus in, you know, say in Florida, in backyards and the high preponderance of backyard pool drownings in Florida, you know, quite different to what the drownings are in Minnesota. Um, right. but we are all part of the same country. It's a land of 10,000 lakes, obviously. So open body water is, is very important to Abby's Hope. Uh, the Taylor family, even though their child died by way of an entrapment, yep. uh, it is a big issue. So each locality uh, is going it is going to be particularly attuned to the risk area there, hopefully. I mean, sometimes drowning is not even paid attention from the public policy perspective, or certainly not enough. Uh, it's yeah. getting much, much better. Credit to you, Adam, and the ND, NDPA helping us all uh, make this a more national uh, concept. But you're right. It's 50 individual. And if you if you layer over that, all the political uh, machinations that go on in state legislatures. And, you know, I have no idea if one member, it gets along with another member and voted for a park or didn't vote for a park that another one was supported. All we're doing, you and I, we go with, we've got a good piece of legislation or a code that we think should be adopted in your state, but you inherit all that small case craziness and sometimes large case craziness. But you just gotta, well, you know, you gotta keep yeah. trying. Like Nancy said, you gotta keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Well, and, you know, let me ask you this. I mean, do you think we focus enough on on the local government? And the reason I ask that is, um, you know, just a personal experience. Um, it, 
my small town in rural western Pennsylvania, we I don't even remember the last time there was a drowning, but um, it was just a couple summers ago, I was actually at a, a conference. It was the first conference after the pandemic that I was speaking at. And I got a phone call from the dean at my university um, who was you know, quite upset. Um, one of our, uh, two of our graduate students, a uh, married couple, uh, had a uh, young boy with autism, wandered away, and I believe he made it a mile and a half away from his house and drowned in a backyard pool. Um, so devastated the local community, put a lot of attention on it. Um, and, you know, it was funny enough that the local uh, uh, township, their governing board reached out to me and said, hey, we know we, we know you're in our community, that this is your expertise. Can you come to one of our local meetings? And um, it was actually eye opening to me because I, you know, this is a very anti regulation part of the country. And here I was sitting in a township supervisors meeting talking about pool fence regulations that they could adopt in the community and they ended up moving forward with a version of something and and the reason i ask that is i mean you know really sometimes where most of the actual governance work gets done that doesn't get a lot of the attention is our local communities it's the local school board the the city council the township supervisors do we pay enough attention to that that local level of advocacy and the answer is no we do not and uh, uh not enough attention, and we should be for two different reasons, probably many more, two come to mind. Number one is, it has taken me years to get to know a member of Congress mm -hmm. uh, over, but your local are literally overstated, but I mean literally your neighbors, your mm -hmm. librarians, the guy who runs the ice cream shop, uh, the mayors of these local townships, municipalities, who have the ability to affect change in their own small community, they're in your world, your daily existence, and it's easier to educate and influence. Mm -hmm. Second thing I would notice, would, would point, which is to your point exactly, when there's an incident anywhere in the country, the people that are affected most are the townships, are the lo little towns. You if you follow the news like I do, we've had shootings. I mean, it is so sad to see how these shootings affect a small town where everybody knows each other at a birthday party, for God's sake. I mean, to approach, to take advantage, for lack of a better word or phrase, of those incidents at the appropriate time, preferably with the support of the family, but I understand that that's not for everybody, to demonstrate, to affect some kind of change can make all the difference in the world. A build out instead of from up to down. Mm -hmm. Pass along Missouri, great. All pools are going to be affected. But there's the other way to do it is to do it, start in St. Charles, then Creef Corps, Missouri, then uh, Kansas City municipality. And all of a sudden, you've got a show me, a show me mentality Look at all the municipalities. Isn't it time we did this statewide? So um, your point is a good one. And all of us should think more about the localities, municipalities, townships as an opportunity to affect, educate uh, public policy. Yeah. So let's uh, let's turn a little bit to talking about Abby's Hope. Um, you know, I think a lot of people see Abby's Hope out there. Um, you know, I, I know many people are familiar with Scott and Katie and their family and the loss of, of Abby and um, really the impact they've been able to make. Um, but you're the executive director of Abby's Hope. You know, tell us how you got there and, and uh, you know, what, you know, what Abby's Hope does as an organization. I don't think people fully, you know, see that whole scope. Well, uh, you know, I, after about 22 or 23 years, I left Safe Kids and was actually expecting to slow down uh, uh, a little bit. And, and almost within a few weeks, I got a phone call from Scott. They were, he was looking to kind of revamp his, his organization. I don't think he was particularly pleased at its programming, its sophistication, and he was looking at it critically and rightfully. Uh, to, to make some changes. And we started uh, talking about what a good executive director might be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe a little bit, I was describing what I could bring to him. That's what he would say. 
I would say I was just describing what I believe is a good uh, executive director. And, you know, we both kind of came to the conclusion, why don't you help us out for a couple of years? Well, that was over 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I've grown to love the family and the cause uh, so well and so much that it's now one of my major clients and my biggest client. And I do the most work for them. Uh, others also, but th them for sure. Um, and uh, that's how I kind of got hooked into it. And to your question as to what Abby's Hope does, I, I won't, you know, go through you know, the bragging and all the programming and so forth uh, about it. We do a lot of stuff. I will say that that Scott and Katie intention, and they are now reaching that inspiration, that intention now, is to have a nonprofit that in the word we use is kind of like the Cadillac of nonprofits in it. It's got a, we believe, it's got a sophisticated program component, a sophisticated PR component to it, you know, the media and their role, a sophisticated advocacy component, not just locally in Edina, Minnesota, but nationally in Congress and the CPSC. Quite frankly, a sophisticated or robust development. You got to raise money, and they do that well. We could always do better. Um, you know, we don't do much on research. That would be the the other component to a Cadillac uh, a nonprofit is to, to get involved in the public health component. But a lot of people do that, and we sponge off that. Mm -hmm. So four out of the five, they do pretty well, and. Uh, uh, it's to their credit that they have the foresight to kind of think bigger than just a, you know, swim lessons locally in their community. Well, what I uh, really love about Abby, so probably I love multiple things, but this is one thing I'm going to point to. And it's something that really just happened in the last couple of years, I believe, which is, you know, you've mentioned Minnesota land of 10,000 lakes and, you know, really, I guess what I'm going to point to is Abby's Hope meeting the problem where it's at in Minnesota, which is, you know, um, I know recently in the past couple of years, you guys give away hundreds of life jackets every thousands. year. Thousands. Thousands. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think Allison told me that the goal in 2022 is to give away 2022 life jackets. And right. I think by June, she had far surpassed that and, and said it might be double that. Um, but I, I think that to me, because Abby did not did not die in a in a lake drowning. Um, she she died in a in a pool uh, uh, incident uh, or the the injury stemming from that uh, that incident. So um, I, you know, I, I I really love pointing to Abby's hope as a model is to really as the problem has evolved and as they've evolved as a foundation. Um, you know, really looking at how they can attack the problem of drowning within within the boundaries of Minnesota. Um, I think it's just been fantastic. I give I give credit to all the families that are in the entrapment. I'm using the quotey quotey finger uh, signs. You know, the Nancy and Katie and Scott Taylor, Karen and Brian Cohen, yep, no, uh, yep. all started on the entrapment. That's how their children, un unfortunately, have passed away through horrific entrapments. But we solved the problem. Now, I don't want to overstate that because you're, we're still out there communicating but we did change the way pools and spas are built and maintained it didn't take long for each of them including katie and scott to recognize in their own community how are kids dying now and forever in water safety and it's the traditional form of drowning a more difficult um solution to that uh there's lots of factors to it and each of those families and in particular in this case uh katie and scott allowed their treasure, their effort, their emotional uh, investment in this to build something that addressed more than just how their lovely daughter passed away. Uh, and the same thing for the other families. And now all three of the families work so closely together uh, on traditional forms of drowning all the time and will continue because it ain't going to have a one piece of legislation that's going to fix the problem. It's going to be done incrementally. It's going to be done through the layers of protection, a public policy component representing each one of them, a programming component re representing each one of the layers of protection. And they 
meaning Katie and Scott and others, uh, recognize that and they allow it to be done. It's a very selfless thing to do, yeah. um, to build a foundation on behalf of a lost child. Yeah. And put yourself out there. I, quite frankly, Adam, uh, I don't think I could do it. I, I really don't. And I I watched yeah. last night and you're you showcased in it. Uh, again, Shay Zeke from No More Under had the screening of her Drowning in Silence feature film, which is going to be on Apple TV May 12th. I'll do a little plug for her. Yeah. Everybody, I suggest watching it. To be able to launch an effort, a campaign, a constant daily reminder of a death, and that's what it is, is a very selfless, not selfish, selfless act. And I'm not sure I could do it. I do it with the cold barrier of employment. Sure, I'm committed to the mission and I can get teary I want to hear their stories, but that's a far cry from personally experiencing a death in the family. Well, I, I there's so much to break down there, but I will say, I mean, um, Katie and I actually had a moment at last year's National Water Safety Conference in Fort Worth. Um, and I've had this moment with a number of, of parents out there who have lost a child, but it almost ends up with both of us inevitably crying, but it it's, why do you do this work? You know, and Katie looked at me and asked me that question. And, you know, I know the intent of it was, you know, I, she's saying, I know why I'm here. You know, I lost a child to this and, um, you know, she's looking at me going, why, why do you put yourself in this line of work? And we both ended up in it different ways, but I've turned around and asked Katie that question, you know, it, it, I, I've tried to do the math over the years and what I come up with is it's less than 1% of the families uh, that lose a family member to a drowning actually get involved in the advocacy work, get involved right. in and whether that's starting a foundation by whether, all definitions right exactly um and and i i kind of am with you there i don't know that i could do it um you know we've all lost family members whether it's you know to an unintentional injury an illness just old age um you know and nonetheless you know tragic nonetheless when you you know you love someone and they they uh, pass on um it's traumatic and and there's grief attached to it and um, it, it is it is always inspiring to me to see these families get involved. And I know you and I, through our work with Families United, um, do get the experience of working with a vast number of families that this, you know, this particular issue has touched. Um, and to me, there's a lot of power there. Uh, these are some of our strongest advocates who can, um, as I always say, I, I can lecture a room for eight hours on drowning prevention, statistics, legislation, advocacy, the whole bit. I may not change one person's perspective, but you put a parent on a stage for 30 minutes or 30 seconds that say, I lost my child to this. Don't let you, you know, your family end up in the same situation. It changes perspective for everyone. Uh, it's uh, admirable and courageous that they're willing to do it. And you hit it spot on. It's the most powerful component. In fact, it's almost difficult to do without their buy-in and their courage. It possibly can be done, uh, but uh, uh, it is so much uh, more effective when you have the families engaged. And thankfully, we've got a good network, which, you know, honestly can be better. We can all be better at, at what we do to get more of the families involved at their own time, when they're ready, if they ever become ready. And mm -hmm. we certainly we've got a vehicle for them to get their feet wet, pardon that pun, uh, on this on this issue. And, and, and Adam, don't, uh, and I know, I know you don't, but don't underestimate the role that you've had in all this. I, I tell you, to be honest with you, uh, Adam, uh, you and the NDPA rejuvenated me in my work and what I'm doing. Uh, of course, I like doing it for the families, but it's nice to have an umbrella organization like this that has a reputation, that has the knowledge, I'm looking at you, mm -hmm. uh, and the reputation uh, to get things done and doing it in partnership, it kind of gives the, the imprimatur of cred credibility for yeah. what we're trying to do. And the more we invest in what you're doing with the NDPA, uh, both, I mean that money, I mean that in terms of time, I mean that in terms of commitment to the projects and you've got so many going on, 
uh, it plays an important role. If you got a nickel, you don't know this, but if you got a nickel every time I mentioned your name in the course of <laughs> daily, daily, just, you know, whether it's the Hill or the CBS yeah. or last night at the screening or in our own programming, obviously the work we do together directly, uh, you wouldn't be a wealthy man, but I might be able to take care of a, a mortgage payment or two. So. <laughs> That's always helpful. Well, you know, and look, it's it, this is where I, I was having a discussion with um, a, a new NDPA partner uh, over the last couple of days. And, you know, they they asked me, they've been in this space for a long time and in a variety of ways. And they said to me, you know, what what do you think is different with NDPA or, or water safety now? And you know, to me, it's it's not about egos or one particular organization, but what we have needed for so long in, in this space is coordination um, and strategy and, and really working as one voice versus a lot of different, you know, sectors and organizations doing great work nonetheless, but how much powerful that work could be if we coordinated it, um, you know, and, and NDPA just plays a part in that. Uh, that's what I always remind people, you know, because I, I I got asked the question just this week of, well, do we need all these organizations out there, whether they be local or state? Can't we just have one big national organization? I said, you know, you could you could take that approach, but you know, to me, all every organization in this space is meaningful because they're each, you know, picking up some part of the mission and carrying it forward. You know, whether that's a family in a local community who has lost a child, whether that's a group of a coalition group in a in a community or a state or whether that's, you know, national volunteers across the country. I mean, everyone's playing a particular role. And it goes back to your comment about every region, every state, every locality has got differences and it's tough to, to lay that umbrella. You're doing as good a job as you can and you'll do better as as we all get better and more sophisticated at what you do. One of the things that that and, and I, know, I know this isn't the let's uh Let's uh, put Adam up on a pedestal uh, podcast, but I do appreciate your um, commitment to the individual members of all the pillars uh, mm -hmm. of it. You seem to know everybody by name. You know their story. You understand where they're coming from, and you bring a little empathy to it, and people recognize it. I think everybody considers the NDPA part of the team mm -hmm. of what we're doing, and that's directly and solely related to not the name NDPA, not the new logo that you that we all launched together a couple years back and the colors and the, the giveaways. It's the people who make, make this up, and there's no substitute for that. The same lesson can be learned for the individual organizations. Good people make good organizations. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Full stop. I don't care how good the message, message is. I don't care how much money you have. If you don't have good people, and we do, we've got the families that have contributed, the courageousness, the admirability uh, to what, what they do, and people like me and you, a staff, who do do this professionally, get a paycheck, but are into and understand the mission uh, of what's going on. And it does feel good making a difference. It really does feel good. Yeah, well, and I think too, it's, you know, it's good people, it's having the right people, right? You know, like, I, you know, don't get me wrong, I appreciate when people bring my name up and things. But you know, if I had it my way, my name wouldn't be mentioned, because it, it's about the organization, it's about the cause that we're trying the the mission that we're trying to achieve, right? And, and you need good people, but you need people that aren't, you know, focused on ego or focused on, you know, it, it keeping things mission central. And I mean, take, Take a look at the VGB and and you know what was accomplished with that law because you you brought up something very specific. It was very technical in nature, right? I mean, this was a rare incident, you know, re retrospective to all the total number of things yes, happening yes. in the environment. Um, but what I really you know often kind of laser in on with with what that law achieved. I mean, if we look at the data of entrapment deaths and injuries happening right now. I mean, from the time that law was passed, I mean, they haven't been completely erased off the map, but Almost. substantial drop um, in frequency. Right. And not, um, any, not any in public pools. Exactly. What's, yeah. what's nice about the VGB, which goes to your earlier point, it was the first national legislation. Sure, it was hyper-technical. Sure, it was at least... Uh, mostly about a particular risk area, 
it's now kind of a Christmas tree, meaning we're hanging a lot of ornaments on the VGB and it's being used as a vehicle in the reauthorization, in how it's touted and communicated in the community as a piece of federal legislation that addresses water safety en masse, in whole, and with, through pool safely, through the grant program, uh, through building an infrastructure at the Consumer Product Safety Commission that lasts beyond me and you, yeah. or Debbie Wasserman Schultz or Senator Klobuchar. Um, it, 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 and it is to address the traditional forms of drowning and other water safety. So the effects of that bill are more than just eliminating uh, an important, albeit rarer, uh, risk area, and now is being used as a vehicle to address the bigger forms of injury and death out there. And uh, we should all be uh, proud of that and use it as well, such. I want to point out something, you know, you and everyone involved with VGB should be super proud of, not just the accomplishment of getting the law passed, but I mean, how many bills can we point to, either federal or state, that actually we can show in data that we're effective that you know set out to solve something and actually solved it um right, right. I, I don't think and that's something you know it, no matter what the topic area some legislation is just never able to point back and go you know we can point that this was successful um and and vgb was i mean you know we, you just look at the numbers um it, it was laser focused on fixing a particular issue and it did it not only was it successful uh, uh, Adam, but I think, and I often, and so does members of the Congress, hold it up as an example of how government should work. An important message now, even more so than 20 years ago, yeah. you know, 15 years ago. There were controversies. We had disagreements. We had to have hearings. We had to get the data. We had to go to the labs to see how these drain covers would work and how the vacuum release systems all work. We won't go into detail on all that kind of stuff, but it was an example of what democracy is supposed to produce. Yeah. A piece of, we had to compromise. It wasn't perfect. Uh, we had to, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. It is a very good piece of legislation. We had to be good at it. And now I'd love to see this bill replicated, whatever it is, if it has to do with polio vaccinations or car crashes or leaving kids unattended in cars, an, a, an issue that's out there, or other issues related to income tax or whatever, we can get the job done. Yeah. Uh, even if you don't have the death behind it. Um, and I, 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 we all, and I am proud of the fact that people do hold that up. I know I do, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy, as an example of a, a piece of legislation that we shall be proud of for what it says about democracy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Alan, I know you and I could probably talk forever, but I'm going to ask you our last question on the podcast that I ask yeah. every guest. Um, if So I'm handing you a magic wand, and that magic wand is capable of changing one thing in water safety, big or small. Yeah. What would Alan Korn change? Yeah. Well, you might think, you might, you might, a very good question. Uh, uh, I wish I had that magic wand. Um, the you might think I might come to you with some kind of sophisticated public policy argument, something related to, you know, I don't know, some legislation or code or something like that. That's not the case at all. I would like I would wave a magic wand magic wand over parents and grandparents, caregivers of children to make the recognition of water. Uh, the risk, I don't like saying danger because we all want to enjoy water and I enjoy water. We want kids of it, but to recognize the risks associated with water in and near and around homes and in their communities and then behave accordingly. The same way you do, you all recognize a car, useful, takes us to parks and amusement parks and restaurants and movies and um, errands and all. It's, it's, it's a, a, a point of joy and a part of life. But we all buckle up our kids, or most everybody buckles up their kids. We wear our seatbelt, wave a magic wand, and have that kind of internal commitment to pools as other risk areas have developed over time. We're getting close. We're a long way away. Getting closer, we're still a long way away from that. You know, Alan, my creative... Abracadabra. My, <laughs> my, my creatives would love you uh, if that wish could come true, because... 
Um, you know, that is truly, I mean, what we find to be sometimes the most challenging thing is how do we properly position this with the consumers? Because, you know, drowning is, is ultimately a very sad subject. I mean, I, I always tell the story when I uh, was defending my dissertation on the subject of drowning, I opened up, you know, you know, kind of with a heartfelt moment talk, talking about the stats and that this, you know, really affects, you know, families. Um, and I'll never forget one of my dissertation committee members, a uh, faculty member that I, I know quite well, I, I had her daughter in swim lessons, kind of came up to me and said, hey, I'm going to provide you feedback later because I, I completely missed your presentation. And I go, you were sitting right there. And she goes, you know what? The moment you started talking about the little kids dying, I started thinking about my daughter and, you know, her potentially drowning. And I completely tuned everything else out. You know, almost every one of the families that we deal with, every single one of them, I can't think of an exception, is willing to have their story utilized to change the behavior of a parent who hasn't experienced this type of thing, and we don't want them to experience. And that's the, the power of that. And maybe that's one way yeah. to get to the sprinkle dust that comes out of the mat is utilize those stories more. You know, a lot of people are afraid of using scaring parents and using emotion i'm not in that camp with the permission of the families and we've got literally yeah. hundreds of families that are willing to share their story like that if they can get a parent to think about the drowning prevention the same way they do about their crib safety their infancy the smoke alarm change the battery for spring forward spring back change the battery that's the type of magic dust i want magic wand being spread um, i love it i yeah. love it well, Alan, I know we could talk forever, but thank you for joining us on this podcast. And most of all, thanks for being a water safety champion. I mean, um, you, you've accomplished quite a bit over an amazing career and all trying to keep kids safer, um, not just in water safety, but in all uh, in many areas of, uh, of uh, childhood. So uh, thank you for all that you do. And uh, thanks for the work uh, you've done and will continue to do uh, to help uh, keep water safer in the U.S. Glad to help. I never say no anywhere. So. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for joining us on the NDPA Water Safety Champions podcast. Uh, join us next week for episode six. Uh, thanks, everyone at home. Mm -hmm.